Hello, everybody, and welcome to the latest episode of the Surge podcast. Uh, first, I'd like to thank everyone for the phenomenal response. I've been getting some great suggestions, um, some great feedback, and one of the topics that was suggested was a topic I probably shouldn't be talking about because there's no way I, I could ever be an expert at it. In fact, to be honest, I'm probably an expert at very few things, but it's what your ICU's role would be in a pandemic. Uh, obviously, the question wasn't phrased that way. It was talk about corona in general or talk about infectious diseases in general. And, you know, in the interest of full disclosure, ID is not my strongest suit. Uh, I'm not a clinical virologist. I've never done any research in the field, and I'm no expert. Um, my field or my background is mainly in general surgery, trauma, and critical care. Um, I do sort of enjoy emergency medicine in general. I like being in the emergency room and I like covering there. I like being in the ICU more. And I like being in the operating room. Uh, in general, I, I like all three aspects of my practice. And although I'm not an expert at, at virulent diseases or virology in general, um, I do tend to have a passion for, let's say, rather than an expertise in. And I might actually do a talk on what I would define as expertise. You should never call yourself an expert unless you know what you're doing. But probably a, a passion for, more so than an expertise in, um, acute medicine in its various forms and deranged physiology. And so with that in mind, I was hoping to talk about uh, how you could prepare your ICU from a managerial position, from a logistical position, from a cultural position, uh, the uh, administrative aspects, the human resource aspects, dealing with families, patients, dealing with your team and the psychological burden on your team, how this can become a more um, productive experience, let's say. Uh, and the practical aspects of running an ICU in the context of a pandemic or a possible pandemic. So uh, the realities of, of, of our situation are as follows. We have very limited knowledge. I think that we're very early, and, and I think that that's true for most pandemics historically. We've never really experienced this within our lifetime, something this significant, right, in terms of an infectious disease origin with this much uh, media stigma and fear involved. We have an extremely limited amount of knowledge, but the good news is that I can see on Twitter, online, in the journals, even in the news media, mainstream media, that by the hour, our knowledge base is maturing. And that's led to some skewed data that's a bit all over the place. And I'll cite some examples soon. But, you know, that's why I think data that we're being given right now should be taken in the clinical context. And nobody should really panic because our reality as intensivists and people who work in the acute care field is that this is what we're built for. Now, other specialists, even clinical people, even highly trained clinical people within their field might have some concerns with regards to the stigmas involved, etc. But for us, this should be like any given Sunday. It should be the regular thing that we do because we're all trained in mass casualty. We're all trained in acute care and we all run highly efficient ICUs. So this is our time to shine. There shouldn't be anybody who's afraid. Uh, it should be less fear and more a structured approach. And we should be the quarterbacks of the hospital at this point. If they ever need us, we're there. And when we are there, there's a structure in place and there's a plan in place and we're supporting each other as a profession. I don't care if you're a doctor, if you're a nurse, if you're a physiotherapist, physician assistant, perfusionist. I don't care if you're an anesthetist, a surgeon, whatever hat you want to wear, emergency physician. People who work in acute medicine, in my mind, it's all the same specialty. It's just looking at different aspects of an extremely complex system, right? The acute care system, in my mind, is one big system. It's one big spectrum of disease. And the more options that you have, the better you get at it. But let's just look at the problem that we have at hand. So uh, in China, between December and January, we were getting uh, preliminary reports about what was reported as an extreme crisis in terms of acute care. It was defined as a preliminary data set that numbered in the thousands, of which a very small percentage. You're talking about less than single-digit percentages here. No matter which reports you look at, whether it's the white papers, the stuff that was in the news, at that time and still today, 
the risk of requiring ICU care, if you have the possibility of novel corona or COVID-19 or COVID-19 or COVID-02 or whatever name you want to label it as, your risks are fairly minuscule of landing in the ICU. They're fairly, fairly small. You, you wouldn't be more than maybe a 10 to 15% chance if, if you're going to go with a theoretical risk. And real world risk, it just hasn't panned out. But what's interesting is that over that time period, the reports that we were getting were saying that, and this is just one example that I've cited, age, comorbidities, and prolonged respiratory symptoms were all poor prognostic factors for poor outcome. And in fact, when you look at the mortalities, only 25% of them were intubated and mechanically ventilated. And at that time, very few people, if not none, actually were reported to have used extracorporeal methods. And this was in December through to January. These were the reports that we were getting back then. So I think it was fairly clear that only 25% of patients got respiratory support or maximal respiratory support for a primary respiratory problem. And that may have influenced the mortality rates that were first quoted. These were the sort of 1.8 to 2% mortalities. A little bit after that, we got a second paper giving us expert recommendations on tracheal intubation of the critically ill. And this is fairly significant because they outlined an extremely aggressive intubation strategy, and they also outlined what you need to do to protect yourself and your team and the rest of the patients. There was a pretty clear recommendation that overall, geographic isolation and staff isolation had to happen, which meant that your staff would be dedicated towards these patients and would not be taking care of the rest of the ICU. And part of the reason for that was the fact that reality being what it is, these patients have a significant amount of burden of stress on the person taking care of them, and they have a significant amount of stress being placed on them themselves as patients. And so therefore, establishing rapport with the same team is very significant. That's one reason. Second reason is to prevent cross-contamination with the rest of the ICU. If, God forbid, one of your medical practitioners was a carrier of the virus, there is a very small chance, but it is there, that it might be transferred to another person within the ICU if you had cross-coverage across the ICU for all patients and not just one person or one group for the corona patients. And I'm using the word corona because it's fairly interchangeable at this point. The second thing that they seem to have outlined is that you need to intubate early. And non-invasive ventilatory methods that we're used to in the West do not seem to have a role with this type of virus. And the clinical deterioration might happen very quickly. And they outline the reason as being twofold. The first is to contain the contamination from secretions and droplets. And the second is to provide more effective definitive support. I don't think that there's anybody who's listening to this who works in an ICU who would not agree that a ventilator is probably the prime ventilatory support outside of extracorporeal means. So it is the definitive therapy. And the problem is by and large respiratory. That's their realities. In terms of recommendations for how to go about protecting yourself during an intubation and what equipment you might need and who should be intubating, which is something that I didn't think of until I got asked the question. I think I'm going to be intubating because I don't want anybody else to be at risk. I would thoroughly suggest that you listen to Scott Weingard's Airway Management for a COVID-19 uh, podcast on the MCRIT podcast. Uh, he did a podcast with Brian Wright earlier this week, and it's simply phenomenal. I can't say enough good things. I, I think like they covered all the bases very well um, in terms of who should be intubating, what adjuncts should be used, uh, what to do if it's a difficult intubation, where you should be intubating, um, what type of protective gear you should wear. All of these things were addressed extremely thoroughly, and I'm not one to reinvent the wheel. Now, if you look at China in February, you started to see them develop a much stronger, more robust stance. As you can see, and this is a video that's been on Telegram, Weibo chat, uh, YouTube, all over the place. Um, they're starting to use ECMO machines. And not only are they using ECMO machines, but they're using universal precautions when cannulating. And they've developed a dedicated team. And you can see in the background that there's a dedicated service line to stabilize the patients, cannulate them. You can see he's cannulating a patient right now as we speak in the background, right? Cannulating the patients 
doing your ultrasound check, having a CPR train on board, and it's all one dedicated team specific towards Corona, as opposed to uh, getting people from all across uh, multiple specialties, etc., and maybe getting uh, the ICU to split their time amongst the Corona patients and the regular patients. These guys have finally figured out that extracorporeal oxygenation has a role, maximal therapy should be instigated if you're in the ICU, and you need to be able to provide the care in a very clear, very ordered fashion, right? And that tells you that be between December and February, there's been a quantum leap in the way that we've been managing these cases, at least locally in, in China where they first started. There's also been a massive increase in the sense of urgency. And I think, you know, as a medical community, it's extremely impressive to see how people have come together and how information is being exchanged, whether it's on Twitter, whether it's online, whether it's with primary care physicians, things like hand washing, when to wear masks, when not to wear masks, making sure that people have a clear understanding of what's going on and having that, that confidence to be transparent about what's going on is simply amazing. Like I think it's to be commended. But our reality is that even with these clinical practice guidelines in place, they don't help us that much when the patient's that sick in the ICU. The good thing is you don't need to panic. And the reason why you don't need to panic is because you have a whole hospital working with you. As the intensivist, the hospital is not working against you. They are working with you. They are here to help and support you. You have a whole legion of expertise working with you. And you have a very limited scope of patients from what we're seeing in the literature to take care of. They're sick. But this is what you trained for. And you know that you're going to do a good job. So relax. First, you need to define what your role is and how to prepare your team. So the logistical aspects of this include, number one, meeting with the stakeholders, the rest of the ICU. Making sure that everybody on your team and on your service in the ICU knows how to do hand washing, how to do gowning, how to wear an N95 mask, and they're all fitted and shaved, myself included. I had to shave for this. Support your colleagues and plans for their departments. Uh, get people into the habit of doing these things right now. So get people into the habit of washing their hands thoroughly before and after they enter the room. Get them into the habit of wearing the N95 masks for your generic isolation patients if you can afford it. And get into the habit of uh, them gowning on every patient. That way when you have the corona patient come in or the patient from the pandemic come in, it'll be less of a stigma and it will seem less difficult on the ICU intuitively because they've already been hardwired for it, right? Um, then uh, what we've tended to do in our center is, we, despite the fact that we've had a very limited exposure to them, practically none, to be honest with you, we discuss scenarios. So we look at what if scenarios. What if the patient comes in and they're hypotensive? What if the patient comes in and um, there are two other patients in the room? What if the patient comes in and there's a failed intubation scenario and you have to bring in a fiber optic into the isolation room? So we look at these problems that might occur and we pre-plan for them by having discussions with the whole team. The next thing to do is actually have a shopping list. So have twice your stock of disinfectant that you think you might need, twice your stock of disposable gowns, twice your stock of disposable ventilator circuits and high fidelity, higher viral filters. So these viral filters are basically microporous filters that can pick up the small size particles um, ever, literally. Have a closed suction ET tube suctioning system and have disposable scopes, if you can afford it, and dedicated ultrasound machine available for those patients. Because you don't want to mix the equipment that you're using for this particular patient population with the rest of the ICU. And you don't want to mix your staffing, just like we talked about earlier. So this is an example of a viral filter. It looks like a humidifier, dehumidifier type of situation. And this is a closed suction. This is actually the Mercedes of closed suctions. I make no money off of the company, but if I were to buy one, I'd buy this because there's an accessory port to it, which I think is a phenomenal trick there. Next, you need to plan your isolation strategy. So if you've ever dealt with isolation patients, uh, I've dealt with TB patients before, um, Ebola patients at one point as well. If you've ever dealt with isolation patients due to a pathogen, the trick is to have a set group of people responsible for that patient that will only be responsible for that patient and will not come in contact with any other patient, one. Two, minimal contact with the patient themselves unless you need to be there. 
And number three, it has to be in a setting that's easily cleanable. And you have to understand that you have to outline a path for the patient to get from the ward or floor or the emergency room to the ICU and then clean that area. And then you have to create another path to the CT scanner and clean that CT scanner. So it wouldn't make sense uh, to have a patient get the CT scan in the middle of the day when you have four trauma patients waiting for PAN scans and two query uh, CTPEs. You know, it just it would block off the CT scanner for literally one to two hours. A really thorough clean for a TB risk or a droplet risk, one to two hours. It's not a joke. And have the meetings with the people involved in this. Make sure that they know what your expectations are, that you need to get CT scans done for these patients, and optimize the timing, either early in the morning at some ungodly hour like 4 a.m., or somewhere towards the end of the day when things are a little bit more quiet. But block off a time when you know that nobody's going to be using the CT scanner and you're not going to put other patients at risk. In addition to that, it should be fairly clear to everybody that there is the option of using that old CT scanner that everybody hates because the image quality is bad. And the reason why is because from what I'm seeing online and from what I've been reading in the journals, the radiological findings on CT scan do not require a high resolution CT. It would be nice to get it and all the pictures are high resolution CTs, but it does not require it to the extent that there's a case series in which low dose CT protocols have been used in pregnant patients with Corona. And we'll talk about that later. So consider using that old CT scanner and dedicating it for these patients. You do not need a high resolution CT scan. And make sure that you have minimal contact between the patient and personnel outside the ICU. Unfortunately, that also means their families. And of course, by default, the current recommendation is negative pressure isolation, which poses its own challenges because how many negative pressure isolation rooms do you have, if you're honest? See, that, that's one of those questions that you need to have with, or discussions that you need to have with your stakeholders before the fact. It can't happen at 2 a.m. And it can't be the MD on call asking the bed manager. It should be a number that's clearly defined and the availability should be known. And just a little bit about what negative pressure isolation means. So this is what positive pressure isolation is. The whole trick between negative and positive pressure is D on this diagram. It's the door to the rest of the hospital. In positive pressure isolation rooms, you want to push the air out so that no contaminated air gets into the patient or into the patient's vicinity or environment. And the idea behind positive pressure rooms is to keep the room clean so that the patient does not get infected. In those cases, the air inlet has to overcome the exhaust system and the ambient airflow. Okay, and there's a way to calculate that. I'll get to it in a sec. But A should equal to B, C, and D here. So the inflow should be just as much as the outflow in the room so that the air is always being pushed out of the patient's way. In negative pressure isolation rooms, it's the opposite. You want air from within the room to only go out through the exhaust system in an HVAC microfilter that's designed to pick up microparticles up to nanomicrons. So in that case, D should suck air in and not let air out, where D is the door. Now, to do this, A and D, so the, the flow from the door and the flow from the air supply, should be equal to the exhaust system completely, B and C, or even B and C should be slightly higher, one would argue, because you have to factor in uh, non-sensible losses in an air leak in these systems, right? This is just the very basics, the basic difference between a positive and a negative pressure isolation room. In negative pressure isolation rooms, you're protecting the rest of the hospital from the air inside that room. And this is the equation for flow. I would recommend an engineering degree, or you can be like me and have no life, and then you'd understand it. So ACH is basically how many cycles and the number of air changes that happen within the room per hour times the room volume over 60, which will give you the setting uh, for the actual HVAC system. And with that in mind, having understood the physics to an extent, one would have to ask, can I convert a regular room into a negative pressure isolation room? Because from what I'm seeing here, it's basically about attaching a motor uh, to your venting system. That's all it really is, right? And in fact, it is. 
And there is a paper that's been published. Now, the paper was published by Occupational Health. It was never published by an intensivist. But that doesn't mean that it's not valid. In fact, you could pretty much jerry-rig any room into an isolation room, right? And I would thoroughly recommend reading the paper just out of interest. It all has to do with mapping, and the best way to learn is to teach your, yourself by buying your engineer a cup of coffee. Every hospital has a biomedical engineering department. They're ridiculously talented, and they usually know what they're doing. Buy the guy or the girl a cup of coffee, have a discussion with them twice a week, and this stuff will seem easy. But effectively, what you're doing is you're partitioning out all of the areas in which you have a clinical practice such that one, two, three, and four act as a inflow by opening up doors physically so that the cross-sectional size of the doors allows the rest of the ventilation in the office to act as your negative pressure, right? And having the air pump through the other side. So buy your engineer some coffee. Now, there, it gets even better, though, because if you look at the Minnesota Department of Health, they actually have a booklet that's basically an IKEA instruction manual on how to convert any room, whether they have a window or not, into a negative pressure isolation room using a HEPA filter jerry-rigged onto an HVAC system, like a regular air conditioning system, right? So that might be something that you might need to consider if you don't have enough negative pressure isolation rooms, that you can actually convert rooms. It's not going to be perfect. I mean you can see they've duct taped everything, right? But it is an option if shit hits the fan, and it's something that you need to consider because, as we all know, designing ICUs is extremely expensive. Designing ICUs with default negative isolation is even more expensive. And uh, this is a very rare event in which we are expected to perform and take a leadership role. Which brings me to the upsurge capacity. So by definition, upsurge is what we're used to being trained for. It's slightly different now, though, but we're used to being trained for when we have an apartment building that has a fire and you have 50 patients coming in. That's what we usually define as upsurge. Now, in the case of pandemics like the coronavirus, in which there's a very low percentage that actually require ICU support, it's extremely, extremely different because you're going to have a slow trickle of patients coming in. And when those patients come in, it's it's an economy of mass. You're going to need more people the longer the pandemic lasts and the longer that supportive care is required. So your staffing has to be more horizontally spread out than with a typical upsurge plan. And we'll talk about that in a sec. When you talk about the clinical aspects of things, the guidelines and recommendations are fairly clear. It's supportive therapy for the most part, with some consideration for antiviral therapy in some cases. The problem with the guidelines is for you to be able to apply them correctly, you need to drill them again and again and again and again and again. And so if you have a simulation program, now is the time to start adding droplet isolation as one of the distractors or droplet isolation as part of the scenario, right? By doing that, you're already sensitizing your team before the fact. You're pre-planning for whatever's going to happen, right? And they're going to be able to rise to the challenge amazingly, and you'll see it. What about ECMO? So here's my take on ECMO in these cases. H1N1, MERS, and SARS have taught us something very important. This technology is too influential to ignore. ECMO should form a part of your strategy if you can afford it. By afford it, I mean you need to have a person who is extremely experienced in ECMO and only ECMO deal with those patients. Again, I repeat that. You're going to need to have an ECMO guy as part of your team that's not going to deal with any other ECMO cases outside of that setting. It can't be a divide and conquer strategy. It can't be a uh, let's make a team strategy because you're very likely, likely to cross-contaminate. Because the thing about ECMO in the acute setting is, as everybody who's done it knows, it requires some patient contact. It requires a little bit of time for you to understand the patient's physiology, right? Uh, for you to fine-tune things. If you're really going to use ECMO in these cases, you're going to have to have enough resources within your hospital such that both the, the equipment and the staffing stays with the corona patients and stays with the pandemic patients. And you don't cross-pollinate with other parts of the hospital. 
uh, for multiple reasons that we'll get into in a second. And be cognizant that the, the concern here is you need the technology to be available to you. But you also need to be able to have the staffing to do it in the right way at the right time, in the right fashion. Now, what about the exceptions, the things that we don't think of? So one example would be pregnancy. Now, has anybody ever talked to you about pregnancy and the coronavirus? Not really. You know why? Because there were only three cases. They were reported in one white paper that has yet to be published. But I'm lucky enough to get a copy. And I've taken their permission, and that's why you have it up here. Um, the authors uh, did a really good job of noting down everything, including the CT scans that they did for the pregnant women. And thankfully, both the mother and the baby are doing fine. They all delivered. And they all delivered relatively well with no major complications. So that tells you that, A, there's no evidence that there is a cross-transmission from the mother to the fetus uh, through the placenta. B, that it is a viable solution. So you shouldn't be getting anybody to panic, right? The worst person had um, the issue of epiglottic cysts, which potentially could have caused a problem for the airway, but it never did, right? They, they all had mild symptoms because they were relatively young and they're not within the at-risk population that we talked about. So again, relax, but prepare for these things. I'm not saying that this should be the first scenario that you guys discuss. I'm saying that somewhere in the discussion, you might want to discuss the exceptional things like this. Next, we're going to move on to the cultural aspects of managing patients in the ICU when there's a pandemic. So when I talk about cultural aspects, in my mind, the cultural concerns in medicine can be divided into three big parts when it comes to the ICU. The first is the uh, administrative human resources concerns. So these include planning for vacations if people need them, planning for adequate staffing, and upsurge capacity, especially if you need ECLS. If you're going to be doing extracorporeal work, you're going to need to understand that the staff that you're going to have for Corona is not going to end up being the staff that you have for the rest of the ICU. Because the staff that you have for Corona are going to have to take care of that. Now, if you have a major disaster, then you switch to your mass casualty algorithm for the hospital, which will include calling in people from uh, two days from now, who are supposed to be on call two days from now and three days from now, and bringing them in so that they help you out. But if you're going to be planning for a dedicated service for corona patients, which is what is currently recommended based on the Society of Critical Care Medicine guidelines, you shouldn't have the same people who are taking care of ECMO across a whole hospital or a whole catchment area deal with the corona patients. Because these patients require dedicated time and because of the cross-contamination risk. And so you might want to actually recruit people and train them to take over certain roles with your traditional ICU patients and your other ICU patients. Then there's the human aspect. So apart from human resource aspects, there's the human aspect. So in everyday clinical practice, most of us make decisions thinking of the patient first. When there's an outbreak, you really have to understand infective origin. You really have to understand that there are three outcomes that have to be aligned, and your mission is to hit all three outcomes perfectly, which is extremely difficult to do. The three outcomes are, one, patient first, patient's outcomes. Then, the risks to staff, and then the risks to other patients. You can't do this unless you have the confidence of the people around you. And unless the people around you can help you out. And unless you provide that leadership role and that safety net. You certainly can't do this if the stakeholders and the in-house team are being directed from people remotely who claim expertise or vice versa. That type of thing might not be okay. The person on the ground and the person who has the time to dedicate for these patients should be the person who's responsible. And they're not just responsible for patient care. They're responsible for patient care. They're responsible for staff care. And they're responsible for protecting other patients within your ICU. So delegate it to a person who you can trust. And make sure that they're qualified. And that's what I mean by joint planning. It's to have somebody responsible for it who feeds back and feeds forward to the rest of the team. 
Number two, you're going to need to manage stress on staff and stress on uh, from other services. So other services might not want to be comfortable taking care of these patients. You're going to have to accommodate them because this is what we do. We are physicians who work in an acute care set setting with extreme physiologies and extreme pathologies. We're the extreme sports guys of medicine. We're not the Olympians. We're the extreme sports guys. We're like the people who will paraglide while skateboarding and uh, trying to ride an elephant. That's what we do. We do the crazy stuff. And the whole hospital knows it. They might not admit it, but they know it, right? So you're going to need to manage their stress. You're also going to need to block off any news from the media that doesn't make sense. And there'll be a lot of it. Okay? Ignore it. And then you need to manage your staff locally. So what I've tended to do after mass casualty scenarios in which I've involved half the hospital, burnt through a lot of resources, destroyed whole OR lists, etc. Things have been cancelled because of, of things that we've had incoming while I was on trauma, etc. Is to have an hour at the end of the day where I debrief with the stakeholders and I debrief with my own team. I just give them an hour to talk it out at the end of the day. Because the worst thing that can happen is for your team to go back home to their families and fill their families with anxiety from what they've seen at work. And with the news that we're hearing about this virus, families are going to be anxious. You have to understand there's a very small percentage of us that have people at home who have the same clinical understanding that you do. If you're listening to this podcast, you have a fair amount of expertise, right? You know what you're doing. Your families don't really know that, and they're worried about you. And so bringing your work home might not be a good idea. You might not even want to talk to them about what you've done at work. You might just say that you've treated the ICU patients like you normally would because of the fact that there's such a significant stigma attached. And talking to people at work might be your only option. So make sure that as, as the leader or the person in a leadership position in, in, in an ICU dealing with a pandemic, you give people that chance. And then share the information that you get with your colleagues. So share the information with your equivalent who has greater levels of expertise and vice versa. Have a discussion where it's, it's an open dialogue and the things that you're worried about are things that they're worried about too. The things that you don't have a plan for are things that they might give you a plan for or don't have a plan for too and therefore you can troubleshoot it out and figure it out. And be aware that, that there is some stigma attached to this. Not all medical professionals will want to deal with corona patients and you will have to address that concern as well now the third part of the cultural concerns are the patient and the family so every patient should get the best care possible but you should never have a scenario where somebody got cross-contaminated from one of your patients it, not even with corona in general but with corona in particular it should be treated as an every event and so that's why perhaps having a segregated group or segregated team that can help you out and that can take care of the patients with you and not be involved with the rest of the ICU, whether it's in your hospital or even outside your hospital, might be the best idea. Having a local ECMO team as opposed to a sort of geographically migratory ECMO team, but having a local ECMO team might be the best option within your ICU because your reality is the rapport will be better with patients. The cross-contamination risks will be less if they're only taking care of those patients for you. And ultimately, guess what? You don't get burnout from working too long. We've all worked too long, for God's sake. Anybody who's listening to this has worked for more than 24 hours. Let's be honest with ourselves, right? You don't get burnout specifically from working hours. You get burnout from quality of care and quality of practice and quality of environment. If you're working in a low-stress environment where people are confident in you and you're confident in their abilities and you're able to support them and you have a dedicated team who you know can deliver and who have been with you in such situations before and you've drilled these things and you've had meetings about it and you've pre-planned for it, you will have excellent outcomes and you will not have burnout. And when your team looks confident, the families have confidence in you. So that's the first thing that you have to think about, is having a dedicated team that will not cause a cross-contamination scenario and will win the family over. Given the media's response, this is key, because you're changing minds here, right? 
this is not something that the, that the family expected. This is not something that the family trained for. You're trained for it, but they're not. For the families involved, this is probably the worst day of their lives. They'd never even, it hadn't even crossed their minds that they would be in this situation. And here you are discussing intubation and ECMO and things like this when the media are telling them that this is the worst thing that's ever happened to mankind, which it isn't. You know it and I know it. We'll get through it. So before your family meeting, make sure that you inform the attending physicians involved that you create a clear plan with supporting information. So there's CT scan data that you know, there's blood gas data that you know, you know all the latest records. Make sure that you know key details about the family and get the family to create some questions. Then plan the message with supporting information. So use the CT scans, the pictures themselves, so that they understand the urgency in the decision-making process and balance the message. When you're ready, inform the attending physician and meet with the family. Meet with the family with somebody else from the multidisciplinary team that the family can get to know. Create a clear plan in front of them and make sure that they understand the plan. And make sure that you introduce yourself and the rest of your team to them as a team, as a consistent team that's going to be with them through the journey. Ask them about the current information that they have. Clarify any misconceptions that they may have. Try to find a member of the multidisciplinary team to help you participate and to help support you as you address their, their concerns. And let them catch up. There's a lot of information to process, right? Let them ask relevant questions and be honest. You're only human. They need to understand that this is a difficult situation and not a difficult doctor and not a difficult nurse and not a difficult team. It's just a difficult situation and that you're there to support them and help them through it. And this goes for your patients as well, obviously. But families and patients should receive that emotional support from you. It's part of the job. Lastly, make sure that you document everything, including the family's concerns and when you're going to meet them next. And if you can't meet them, you need to document why. Remember, you dealt with the worst and the best that the hospital's thrown at you. You're, you were worked in acute care all your life. This is what you've been built for, right? You've dealt with drunk people at 2 a.m. You've dealt with uh, crash intubations. You've dealt with esophageal intubations. You've dealt with the worst and the best, the most acute and otherwise. People coming in from burning buildings. You've dealt with it. Do not succumb to the stress and the pressure. Develop your team now before you get the first phone call for an admission to the ICU and provide them with the support. And make sure that your stakeholders know that you have a plan even if you need more negative pressure isolation rooms. Print out that Minnesota manual. Print it out. Go online. I left you the link. I left you the resource. And print it out. Go through some scenarios with your team. Make sure that everybody's confident in their knowledge base. Make sure that everybody is N95 fitted. Pre-plan and relax, man. You've got this. So this is Saad al -Zaid. Thank you for listening, and be sure to subscribe. Uh, thank you for the excellent feedback once again. It's extremely flattering.